Well, welcome to worship. Glad you're here today. I'm Jeff, and I'm the pastor here. And uh, it's a great privilege to serve this church in this place. Um, God loves you for sure, but I want you to know I love you too. And um, uh, it is an honor to serve you. Well, today we are talking about heaven. We're in this heaven series, and today specifically the hope of heaven. And man, don't we need a little hope about heaven. How many of you guys use a little hope about heaven today? Okay, raising my palm. Matter of fact, give it up. Let's give it up loud. If you could use a little hope about heaven today. Um, most of us could. Most of us could. You know, just next week in about eight days, we've got this great big eclipse thing coming to southern Kentucky. Any of you guys paying attention to this? This solar eclipse is coming? Anybody? It's going to be a big deal. It's going to be kind of a big thing. Hopkinsville, Kentucky is like the epicenter for the whole galaxy of people who love astronomy coming to Hopkinsville. I mean, <laughs> it would be the only time in history, I guess. I mean, Hop- Hopkinsville is a big, big deal right now. So he's going to be hopping in Hopkinsville. There's people there trying to see that, that eclipse. It's going to be this amazing spectacle in the heavens where God displays his power in an amazing way. For us in 2017, with telescopes and with all the cool stuff we have to explore the heavens, we have some understanding of what's going on. It's not as freaky. But if you could imagine, go back several thousand years. And imagine you you were out in the field with your family, and you were plowing in a field, and this event begins to happen. What would go on in your heart at that moment? Wouldn't you grab your kids, and wouldn't you be wondering what on earth? It's noon, and all of a sudden it's dark. Would that not be the weirdest thing ever? And what would you assume caused it? I mean, the reality is, is that some of the ancients were the Incas, Aztecs, Peruvians, Egyptians, the astrologers out of, out of uh, Persia, incredibly brilliant people. Unfortunately, so many of the work that they did in astronomy has been lost to dust and to ages. But they had figured a lot of this stuff out, and they had, they had, they had built these calendars of when these events would happen because it was, must have been so overwhelmingly scary that they had to figure out what is that and where is it coming from and when is it coming back. And so really smart people, I don't know how they did it without calculators and whatever, but they figured out a way to know when these events would happen. Thousands of years ago, they began to predict. But somehow, some way, it was overwhelming. And sometimes events in our life are overwhelming, right? Had the privilege of driving to Richmond, Kentucky last night to pick up my favorite youngest son from my mom and dad. My mom and dad still live in Corbin, Kentucky. And Caleb, our youngest, went down to visit his cousins. And they went, he went to the annual uh, festival there in Corbin. It's Nibrock, which is Corbin spelled backwards. So he went to Nibrock Festival and rode the rides and did the things there with his cousins. Had a, had a big time. But uh, we had to retrieve him from Richmond last night, about halfway between Corbin and here. So on the drive down last night, Julie has the radio and scan. You know, like we push the button and it scans through stations. And she did something she never does because she's a total musician. She doesn't like talk. She doesn't like sermons. She doesn't like, she just likes music only, okay? If she could just have worship with only music, she would be really happy. So if you're advocating for that, she's your advocate. Um, I'm standing my ground. I'm preaching, woman. Um, so anyway, but she actually did something she never does. The radio scanned to like a talk radio thing, and she pressed a button and let it stay on talk radio, which I love. I mean, I'm, I'm all about it. I love to learn stuff. Do it. Is that what? Is it a man thing? Okay. Oh, I'm getting I'm getting a lot of yeses from the women. It's like it's a man thing. Okay. Well, maybe it's a man thing because I just love to learn this stuff. However, this was a really freaky show because the first thing I hear is this guy's kind of a gravelly voice. He's like, "Yes, when the submarine comes out up out of the ocean and then it shoots this missile up into the air over the United States, and then then they're going to have these three bursts, and it's called an EMP." It's an electromagnetic pulse, and it's going to knock out our whole eastern power grid, and, and millions of people are going to be without power, and in a few days, it's going to be total anarchy, and most of us are going to die. And it gets worse from there. I mean, it's just like, I mean, it's like, and then he tells us how you're going to die and how your neighbor's going to eat you and stuff like this. It gets to be this really bad thing that, that it, was, it was pretty bad, okay? And so, and so this thing is happening, and we're listening to this, to this, deal of them talking about how this electromagnetic pulse thing is going to knock out your car. You'll be driving down the road and your car will go dead. Your radio won't work. Your computers won't work. Internet won't work. 
Social media will be gone. <laughs> Some of you, all right. Okay. Bring it on. Okay. So, yes. so, but this EMP thing is going to wipe out life as we know it. And they're very concerned that we're not ready here in the United States. And they went on and said that China has this power. They could use this EMP to knock out our, uh, our uh, aircraft carriers, that our aircraft carriers are vulnerable. And, and that, of course, Iran and North Korea and others who hate us have this capability and they're plotting against us right now. So it's this giant conspiracy theory radio show kind of thing about how we're all going to die soon in a very bad way. And it reminded me that here's the reality for all of us, that death is stalking us all. Death is stalking us all. It's after all of us. Now, if you're not afraid of an EMP, you might be afraid just to stay up late and watch television while your spouse goes upstairs to go to bed. This is what happened to one of my friends this week. Her name is Terry. Terry's husband, Mike, said goodnight to her, kissed her goodnight. He walks upstairs to go to bed. She's watching television. A few minutes later, Terry sends a text in gibberish to Mike. And it's got all these numbers, like letters. This looks like somebody just scrambled on a keyboard. And at the very last sentence, I am having a stroke. And Terry's a jokester. Some of you know Terry, Terry Wilson. She's totally. And so Mike's like, no, she's just kidding. So he thought, well, maybe he goes downstairs. Terry is slumped in her chair with the phone in her hand. She had dialed 911. EMS was on the line. Mike takes the phone out of her hand, and they're on there, and he directs her to the house, directs them on into the house. She's in the hospital right now. We, we're praying for a full recovery. But, man, you just don't know. Death is stalking us all. We have no idea what the next moment is going to bring. I tell you, as a pastor, I see so much. I have to detox this stuff all the time. I have a counselor, by the way, okay, because uh, I'm taking in a lot of stuff. And so you see all these things happen in people's lives. And, and you know, man, you gotta got to deal with this. And so, uh, so we just know that death is stalking us all. This is also what I know, according to statistically, however you can say that word, um, according to people that study these sorts of things, they tell me that at least 33% of us are scared to death of death, that we're absolutely frozen in our tracks. We are frightened out of our mind about what death is and what death will bring scares us to death because death is stalking us all. And it brings us to the question that was asked in the book of Job in Job 14, 14. And here's the question. If someone dies, will they live again? If someone dies, better said, when someone dies, will they live again? The answer, according to God, through his scriptures is yes. And you'll live again into a life that's bigger and more abundant and more alive than you've ever been. That's a promise to all who follow Christ, who all who've been brought into his into his fellowship as a child of the Most High God. That's a promise you can take to the bank. God says, yes, you will live again. There's a great hope in the resurrection from the dead. The mechanics of which, even though the scriptures speak to the idea of life after death, they don't give us every answer that we want, but we know this. This is the big overarching promise. I want to leave you with this. If you don't remember anything else for today's sermon, this is the most important thing to know. Uh, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, your last breath here will be your first breath there. You'll close your eyes here and open them there. Billy Graham, when he's asked, well, where are you going when you die? After being the man of God he's been for for. Dozens and dozens of years, leading millions of people to become followers of Jesus. His answer about where he goes when he dies, he says, I'm going to be with Jesus wherever he is. And that's a person that studied a lot of scripture. And I'll take that as a good enough answer for me too. That wherever Jesus is, that's where I'm going to be when I die. And again, not all the mechanics, we get glimpses. We don't know every mechanic. We don't know every detail. We know that Jesus said to a thief that was hanging by his side when 
when that thief asked Jesus, he said, would you remember me today? And Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, what does that mean exactly? Jesus doesn't tell us. Scriptures don't tell us. Our best theologians can only guess. But it's good enough for me to know I'm going to be with Jesus because if where Jesus is, it's going to be a good place. Would it be okay for you to be there too? Yes or no? Would that be good enough, you think? If Jesus lives there in eternity, in all his splendor and glory, the one who created everything that you can imagine, this, this earth is magnificent as it is. All those slides you put up there, Mike, that last song, beautiful, remind us of the worship of the power and the majesty of God. If he did that in just a few days, imagine what he's been doing all these thousands of years. Can you imagine? Can you even get a glimpse of what it must be like where God resides and where Jesus hangs out? And that if you know that your last breath here is your first breath there, that gives us a little bit of moxie and a hope past this moment. And I just want to encourage you with this today. Um, in First Thessalonians 4.13, it's written, Brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. There is, you don't need to grieve as one with no hope. If you follow Christ, if the one you love is a child of God, if they've chosen to enter into a fellowship with him, you have nothing to fear in death. The process of dying can be hard. There's no question. You've seen it. I would be lying to you if I didn't say that sometimes a certain disease or certain types of pathways to die are brutal and harsh. They are, that is true. But they are light and momentary compared to what's coming to us. Does this make sense? You may go through a season in this life where you struggle as you go through a dying process where this body decays. But at the end of that moment, when you do die, there is, there is the moment of being with heaven, being with Jesus in heaven, whatever that is, paradise, heaven. I believe for a season, this is my personal belief after studying this, and I can take you to scriptures that will show you, but other theologians can take you to other scriptures, and they would say it differently. I can't, I don't know which one of us is right. This is my best guess, is that when I die, I will be with Jesus but I will not have a body yet. I will be with him in spirit form. But that someday at the resurrection of the dead, that all of us who follow Christ will be reunited with resurrection bodies that have these supernatural powers, and we will live in a heaven that's far beyond anything we can imagine. And it won't be floating on a fluffy cloud playing a harp. Okay? It's not that. You know, I, some people quipped before, like, if that's it, I'll take the other option. Okay? <laughs> because I just don't want to do it. Um, Heaven is going to be magnificent. There will be things to do. There will be people to know. There will be fellowship to be had. There will be meals to be had with people that you love and that love you. You will know and be known. It will be a fellowship like none other with no corruption, no jealousy, no anger, no people quitting the game, no people walking out on the relationship. It will be a perfect fellowship. Won't that be magnificent? Where everybody is loved and fully loved. Won't that be incredible? The best fellowship you've ever had, the best meal you've ever had, the most celebratory Christmas dinner you've ever had multiplied by a zillion. That's heaven. Pretty cool, huh? The, the, the most magnificent moment you've ever had in your life, the most alive you've ever been multiplied by a zillion. That's what we're living. That's what we're heading towards. That's what we're into. We're living into a great future that's far beyond what we could ever imagine in our minds. So don't grieve as those with no hope. We are going to lose people. So far, death is batting a 1,000. There's only one who's escaped, and his name is Jesus. But he makes it possible for us all to escape someday. Jesus says in John eleven twenty five, 25, he says, I am, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. Even though they die. Isn't that magnificent? I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. Now, the question here around this believes concept, I talk about this a lot with you because I want you to really own what it is to believe and the way Jesus constructed the word. It wasn't a word he used, actually. He was speaking a different language. This is our best guess at interpreting a word. To believe in Jesus, if you take his whole teachings, is to take on the way of life of Jesus. It is to believe in him, to trust him as his way of living, as your way of living, uh, as to take him as your Lord and your Savior. 
not just to say a trite prayer because you're scared of going to hell. Now, you've probably not heard this before. This is going to make some of you mad. I want to challenge you to take on the full teachings of Jesus. Don't be babies about this. Grow up. Study the scripture. Read what Jesus said. He invites people to come follow him as a way of life. That's what it is to become a follower of Jesus, to take on one who believes in Jesus, put the full weight of your life on the teachings and the path and the way of Jesus, not just a head nod, oh, Jesus is a nice guy. Or you wear a t-shirt, Jesus is my homeboy. He ain't your homeboy. He is your Lord. He is your Savior. Stop belittling him and making him smaller than he is. He is the Father, God, creator of the universe, the triune with the Holy Spirit. He is huge. He is Lord. If you take him as Lord and you follow him as Lord, you have great assurance in the future. Let me be more clear. Hell is not an oops. If you, if you are going to live out of fellowship with God your entire life, if you turn your back on God your entire life, and if you arrive at the gates of eternity, don't be surprised if he gives you your wish in eternity as well. This is what it is to believe in Jesus. It is to take his teachings as being serious, as being true, as being a pathway to real life, a life that doesn't just start when you die, but a life that starts now. I get asked all the time about people, are they in heaven or are they in hell? Here's my answer. I have no idea. Only God knows. Only God knows. Only that person in God knows. Because I don't know that person's story. I don't know what they've been through. I don't know at what point in their life they may have turned very sincerely to Jesus and decided, you know, I'm going to follow him with my whole heart. And they may have indeed started on that path. And it, but I don't know. I don't know what happened to them. I don't know where they got tripped up. I don't know what great sadness fell on their life that put them in a shadow that was hard to come out from under. I don't know what depression they may have lived with. I don't know their whole story. So here's my answer to you. I cannot tell you who's in heaven and who's in hell. I can only tell you what the scriptures teach and what Jesus said. And he said, come follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. Come follow me. And today you'll be with me in paradise. He says to a thief who had lived a rotten life all the way up to the end, the very last phrase of his life almost, Jesus remembered today and Jesus said, you'll be with me in paradise today. So can you earn your way to heaven? No. Can you be good enough to go to heaven? No. How do we get there? Because Jesus makes a way for us to get there. So I don't really know a person's path inside their heart. Do you? Do you dare try to judge the heart of another person? I hope not. So let's be gracious. And let's just simply say they are in the hands of God, a loving, great, wise God who I trust. And you can trust him too. Is that fair enough? We let people be in the hands of a mighty, wise, powerful all-knowing God who sees that person, loves that person. It is not God's will that anyone should perish, but that all should come under the sway of Jesus to follow him, to take him on as their way of life, to believe in him and all that Jesus meant for that to mean. Not in a small way, not in a trite way, not in just a head nod, Jesus, my homeboy way, but a kneeling at the cross and saying, I believe that Jesus is my path, and I take him as my way. Are you with me? Understand. This is important. Because some of you today are standing on this moment, and you are afraid of, de of dying. And quite honestly, you might should be. Because to this point... This Jesus idea has just been something in your noggin. Just been a little notion. You just did a little head nod. Friends, it's time for you to turn your heart fully toward home. It's time for you to come under the sway of Jesus. It's time for you to accept his teachings as your way of life. It's time for you to repent of doing life on your own. It's time 
to stop being your own Lord and Savior and to turn to Jesus, who's the only one who can save you and adopt you and graft you into the family of God. It's time. So if you've never done that, today's your day. Today's your day to come and repent. Today's your day to come sit on this front row. Muriel Thompson is going to be here to work with you and to pray with you and to love you into the arms of Jesus at the end of the service. If you need to make that move, today's your day. If you need to move from just head knowledge to heart knowledge, from, from just thinking about Jesus to really loving him and following him, then today's your day. You don't get, you don't have to, there's nothing you have to do other than just come say, I want to be a follower of Jesus. This is where it opens. And then the heavens open up and all the promises that Jesus makes for those who follow him open up to you. Won't that be good? Won't that be fantastic? It's time. It's time. I want you to do that today. I want you to come do that today with us because I want you to have this great hope. I don't want you to be scared to death of death. Process of dying, yeah, it could be a little scary, but I promise you, once you fully kick this bucket, the next one's great. It's fantastic. Okay? We may have pain, sorrow, suffering in this life. There's no way around it. It's coming to some of us. It's, we need this hope of heaven to face the realities of life. You know, a couple of our church family are facing some struggles this week, and I want you to pray for them. I want you to pray for Mert, who normally sits about right where you are. Mert has surgery tomorrow. Mert's our oldest member in our church and, and wisest. She may be the wisest, too. She's a, she is the oh, that's right. It's a better said. Mo, you, she's trying to help me here. She is the most seasoned member of our church. Thank you. That's better. Cut that out, okay? Just erase that one. Cut. Um, so uh, this is all live. It's all the time. So um, she has surgery tomorrow. About what is it? Two thirty, Mike. Um, and so pray for Mert. Um, I'm not even sure what she's having done, but but any surgery when you're in that age range is tough. And then pray for Kathy Hartman, Kathy and Steve, sweet couple. Got to visit with Kathy yesterday. Kathy's been being treated for cancer for a while, and um, they, it was mostly in her lungs. They've now found, found it in her brain. And as they've analyzed it more, they realized the cancer may have started in her brain with a very small nodule that some way they didn't detect earlier that went to her lungs and now back, and now it's more present in her brain. Um, she was supposed to do some treatments last week, but she fell and broke her leg last week. So she's had a broken leg. She's in the, she can't get out of her bed. She starts treatments, very aggressive treatments tomorrow. So would you pray for Kathy and Steve as well? And see, we're all going to come to these moments. Kathy told me yesterday, she said, I was so healthy my whole life just until I got this, and now I've been in the bed a lot. Life hits us hard sometimes. Kathy needs the hope of heaven, doesn't she? My hope is that she recovers fully, and that's what we're praying for. But in light of all that we face in life, we need a hope bigger than this one, don't we? We need, we need to know there's more, that this isn't all there is, because if this was all there is, it'd be tough. It's wonderful. I love life, but I'm glad to know there's more. So we need this hope of heaven. We need to know about the resurrection of Jesus. We need to enter into that time. So there are three things, three hopes that, that heaven brings us. It establishes our value, that God would come after us, that God's, God loves you so much. He created you to have an eternity with him. Isn't this good news? God wants you, and this is the big news, God wants you to be in heaven with him forever. Young people, did you hear that? God wants you to be in heaven with him forever. He made you for eternity. He made you because he loves you. He made you specifically like you are. And he wants to have a relationship with you that goes from here all the way through eternity. That's what he wants. That's pretty cool. And you can step into that by accepting Christ as your Savior and beginning to follow him. That's where we start. God wants to have a relationship with you. Lee Strobel, who wrote this book on hope that I'm borrowing some of these ideas from, he reported watching one of those nature shows. I love nature shows. You guys like nature shows? Like National Geographic, the nature shows, shows the beautiful nature and all that stuff. And he reports about watching this show when he was writing this chapter about this. And he said, there was a beautiful scene, and these ducks were out on the pond, out on a little lake, and they're swimming around. There's a mama duck and 12 little ducks. The mama duck comes to the side and jumps up, starts falling, and ducks 1 through 11 kind of have trouble getting out, but finally they all make it out, except for the 12th one. The 12th one is trying to get up over the little wall at the edge of the lake, paddles up, boom, hits the wall, falls back. Paddles up, hits the wall, boom, walks back. And the mama duck's walking, and 
little duck backs up, poof, walks back. Then the mama duck looks back and then turns around and keeps walking. And the narrator said, this is the way it is in nature. That little duck is not going to make it. And the mama duck does not care. So mama and 11 take off and 12 still paddling around waiting, waiting to get eaten by a snapping turtle. Just saying, friends, you wanted the happy ending too bad. This is how real life is. If you're the baby duck, sometimes you're just going to get eaten. Death is stalking us all, I've warned you. It's coming. That's in real life. That's real nature. However, however, isn't it good to have a shepherd who, when he sees that he's missing one, comes back? Isn't it good to have a God who looks around and says, oh, man, I got 99, but I'm still missing one. He's still missing you. And he comes back and he finds you. He picks you up on his shoulders, and he carries you through the valley of the shadow of death. See, we, we don't have a mama duck. We got a father, shepherd, God, Jesus, Holy Spirit entity that loves us, comes after us, seeks us, wants us to be in heaven with him. Isn't that good news? So it establishes our value. We're worth more than a baby duck. The hope of heaven bolsters our courage. It gives us courage to face the things that we face in life. That's the second hope it brings us. And, and Paul reports that the light and momentary troubles we have with this life are nothing compared to what's coming at us in heaven. Because what's coming at us in heaven is so much grander, so much bigger, that we can face the challenges we face in life. You know, when you face difficult times in life, this is what you could say to yourself. It's going to be okay because I'm going to heaven. And when I go to heaven, everything's going to be made right. To remind yourself, to preach to yourself, to talk to yourself about a hope you have beyond this momentary struggle because you will have moments in life when it's going to be hard. You will have moments in life when you're going to struggle. This is true. That's for all humans. But we also can have a great hope that these are light and momentary struggles in comparison to the weight of glory of being in heaven with God. So this heaven idea, it ignites us with an excitement about our future. You can have an excitement, maybe not about how you're going to die, but that after your death, as you enter into eternity with Jesus, that you have this great hope. It can give us some power to get through life, right? It can raise our sights up where they need to be. And so this is also what I want to remind you. It's important to talk to yourself about when you're facing challenges from somebody, maybe someone doesn't like you or they turn their back on you or they're slandering you somehow or whatever. This is what you have to know. If you are a child of God, you've chosen to enter into life in his family. There is nothing that can separate you from the love of God. Isn't that good news? There is nothing that can happen to you here that will separate you from the love of God for eternity. There's nothing that can happen to you here that will separate you from the love of God. This gives us hope and resilience and a bit of armor to face the challenges of life because we know there's nothing that can happen to us here that will snatch away our eternity. There's nothing that can take us out of the grip of grace. There's nothing that can keep us from that eternity with the Father who loves us and who desires to have a relationship with you that lasts throughout eternity in a perfect fellowship in a more amazing place than we could ever imagine. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 tells us this, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. Isn't that good news? There's nothing. You can't even begin to imagine what God has prepared for you. Jesus said to his disciples, I'm going to prepare a place for you so that where I am, you can be also in my father's house. There's many man or many rooms or some translations say many mansions. But this is what we know. He's been preparing a place for you and for me to come live with him. And it's going to be more magnificent, more wonderful, more alive, more vibrant, more colorful, more big, more bigger, -er, more wonderful, -er, more bester, -er, than you could ever think, imagine. Take your wildest imagination, pump it up on steroids, multiply it by a zillion, and you still don't have heaven. This is the good news, that there is a hope. There is a life beyond this one. There is a moment beyond this one when, when you, can, you, can, you can step into this by becoming a follower of Jesus. 
Many of you know I grew up in Corbin, Kentucky. You've heard me talk about my little church, Calvary Baptist Church. One of the greatest gifts that the pastors at Calvary Baptist Church gave me, a guy named Carl Evans, one of my preachers there, he taught me a thing called the Roman Road. And it comes out of the book of Romans. And it tells you, how do you enter into this eternal life? How do you get to eternal life? So I want to take you through just a little bit of that. The Roman road says something like this, that we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We're just simply not good enough to be in heaven on our own. But Romans 5, 8 turns and it says this, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ, our Lord, who loved him and gave himself for us while we were still sinners, while we were still messed up, while we were still far off. While we were still the baby duck that can't get out on our own, God comes back to rescue us. And it goes on and says that he gives the right to become children of God to all who call on him and who believe in his name. That if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you're going to be saved. And I want you to have this hope. I don't want you to fear death. I don't want you to be freaked out. Man, you're going to die. 100% guaranteed. But you don't have to stay dead. And you don't have to face an eternity without God. You can have an eternity with God the way he wants you to have it if you'll choose. Your choice. A magnificent, wonderful God creator gives you a choice. Heaven with him hell without him you choose your choice you pick kind of crazy that God would give us that kind of power isn't it God is not sending you anywhere you are making a choice so you choose what will you do what will you choose I'm hoping I'm praying, I'm begging, come down here, get this done, choose life with God, choose believing in Jesus, choose taking his way of life, choose life, choose eternity, choose heaven. It's all here for you. Just choose. Would you pray with me?